First, I want to start by acknowledging the awkwardness of opening a presentation in the conference on Pama Sambhava with the topic that I am suggesting. But as a historian, I'm frankly mystified by why we treat this figure, Padmasambhava, as a historical figure. Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to get that out there at the beginning. Um, and, and, and I also want to say I, I'm not a specialist in this period. Uh, I, I work on what I think of as modern Tibet, 1600 and mm -hmm. later. So it's quite possible that, that I will be schooled today in you know, what I've missed in some of the sources. Um, but I want to raise questions and how I got to these questions about what seems to me the unsubstantiated assumption that Padmasambhava, at least this narrative that we have from the 12th century of Padmasambhava linked to the, um, the emperors of the Tibetan imperial period, um, this assumption that, that, that there was a Padmasambhava who had these connections. It's in every introductory source that I can find. I come to these questions because I have to teach my one course that goes beyond the 1600s is a Tibetan Civ class, and I have to teach this to 80 to 100 students, and there's no material that I can give them that feels to me like an honest reckoning with the imperial past. Um, I feel like we're presenting myth as historical narrative, and I find that very problematic. Um, so my point here today is just to say that I can see no evidence from the imperial period and it is not like there's no textual evidence from this period um, that even mentions this figure. And so I've been mystified that, that Western academic scholars talk about this figure as if he really existed in this period. If someone was of such major significance as he is described as having uh, in later sources, it's inconceivable to me that he's not mentioned anywhere in contemporary sources, right? I've had Tibetans tell me that I just haven't looked at the right sources, um, that of course there are contemporary sources. Um, but the very earliest sources that even mention this name or some variant of this name uh, from Dunhuang barely hint at anything close to the role that he is said to have in uh, later, uh, especially 12th century sources, as far as I can tell. And I'm certainly fine with bracketing the question of the historicity of this figure and talking about his importance for later Tibetans. 12th century and onward, it's very clear that he's a figure to be reckoned with. But when we're talking about the imperial period, I don't understand why we're engaging with these later narratives and pushing them back into the past. Um, they're 300 years later, right? Nyangrel Nima Oser is writing about this narrative in, in a way um, that doesn't make sense with the contemporary sources that we do have, right? That, that relationship with the emperors that, that is being described in those sources does not gel with anything that we have in the earlier sources in terms of making sense of the, the relationship. So to me, it seems like talking about Merlin being real in English history. And I'm a big fan of Arthurian lore. Um, I just wouldn't teach it as, as part of English history. Uh, for courses on history, uh, I mean, for courses on literature or myth or, you know, the later development of proto-nationalist ideas, yes, this all makes sense. And I think that's where uh, Pama, discussions of Pama Sambhava need to fit in. And, and just to remind you, the similarities are quite striking with Merlin, right? He's a legendary figure, best known as the wizard, featured in these Arthurian legends. Um, and, and he's emerging of two different uh, figures, you know, there, there was a figure, a wizard who had that name, but who had no relation to any, anyone named Merlin, uh, to anyone named Arthur. And then there was a political figure that had some, you know, maybe historical association that we can, we can trace back to sources. So the fact that someone like Padmasambhava or someone with variants of the name Padmasambhava shows up in Dunhuang materials, okay, maybe there was someone of that period who had that name at least it shows up in these 200 years later, but it didn't have the kind of magical role uh, or role at the court that, that uh, Padmasambhava is said to have. Um, and and you know, people who write about Merlin talk about the, this legendary his, history of Britain being created partly to form a body of patriotic myth uh, with different agendas going on in the literature. And I think that's the approach that we need to take to the generation of narratives about Padmasambhava. I think in the Dunhuang materials, we can see that there was no concerted effort to create a narrative around this figure that had important links. And so if we 
you know, if we, if we look at materials as historians do, um, not retrospectively starting in the present and saying, how do we need to get to Padmasambhava today? It's obvious that Israel is very important today. But if we, if we don't read back into the Dunhuang materials using Yangrel's vision of Padmasambhava and trying to connect the dots and saying maybe it, it could make sense, I think we will have a better reckoning. Um, and just to remind you of the kind of sources that we do have uh, for the imperial period, we have sources about emperors and generals, we have sources about ministers and monks. And yet, even in Tri Sundetsin's own justification for why he embraced Tibetan or Buddhism, uh, it wasn't yet Tibetan Buddhism, why he embraced Buddhism in Tibet, there's no mention of uh, Padmasambhava. We have inscriptions, bell inscriptions, and so forth from Samya Monastery where Padmasambhava was supposed to be so important. No mention of Padmasambhava in these materials. So I think it's really only 200 years later that we run across this figure. And if we think, you know, in our own time what this means, right, what would an American historian do with a source that today started to talk about the hero of the War of 1812 uh, out of Ex Nilo, right? Uh, we wouldn't want someone a thousand years from now to take that new invention, maybe a fictional narrative of um, some relative of Trump's or something for political purposes um, that got inserted into the past uh, in our own time to be really relevant. Um, or to take another example, you know, we know that John Harvard started Harvard University in 1635 and part of his role was to tame the Native Americans with Christian texts and so forth. But if there were to be a biography of John Harvard that was written today that talked about the importance of the research university and the liberal institutions that spread from that kind of uh, beginnings, we wouldn't take that biography seriously as a source for John Harvard. And that, I think, is the, the sort of parallel for taking Myungrel's history Seriously, and, and I know the frustration when I teach these courses to, Tibetans, uh, to, to uh, my Tibetan Civ class. It is very frustrating to talk about the Tibetan Imperial period without having some nice, neat package narrative about why Tibetan Buddhism was so successful and so forth. But I think to, if we're going to be honest with ourselves and with our students and with the, the academic and general uh, public, I think we need to look carefully at these sources and see what we can uh, make of them. Um, and, and hopefully, I'm, I'm completely wrong, and my, my colleagues here will, will show me the evidence to, to make me make sense of this figure in, in Tibetan history. And, and I do uh, really you know, throw this out there as a, as a kind of, pos it's possible that I'm completely wrong, and uh, uh, I'm really open to, to evidence, but I think we need evidence and reason and, and you know, uh, standards of historiography to carefully look at this period to, to try to make sense of Padmasambhava as a historical figure. If we want to bracket that and talk about him post 12th century and the importance he has for Tibetan culture, absolutely, I am completely in agreement with that. And now I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Gray. I, I actually um, found this very interesting, knowing the general gist of where you were headed to think, think through some of these materials I've been working on. So thanks for raising this issue. Um, I want to make clear from the get-go, I agree with Gray that we'll likely never know whether Pamasamava really existed a, as a historical person. Um, as Gray has observed, we have no evidence that's clearly contemporary with uh, the master's late 8th century dates. Uh, so I'll spend my time here discussing some of our earliest evidence on him, um, but I do agree none of it is conclusive. And in the end, I can only advocate agnosticism. Oh, that's my half-opened Padmasambhava, because this is the beginnings of the myth. Um, uh, so all that said, I, I, I want to review here the earliest evidence on, on this, our second Buddha, starting with these Dunhuang manuscripts. Um, and then later, I'll move along to this one commentary that I've been reading a little. 
Um, among the materials found in the famous library cave at Dunhuang are four manuscripts that speak explicitly of someone named Sambhava or Padma Sambhava or something like that. All four, as Gray noted, date to the late 10th century, uh, almost exactly 200 years after the master is believed to de have departed Tibet. Two have been studied extensively by others, and the other two I discovered back in 2002 and presented to the scholarly community in a 2004 article. In fact, the discovery of ancient manuscripts uh, relating to Padmasambhava has, of course, an elaborate and ancient history in Tibet. According to the tradition of Terima or tre treasure revelation, the 8th century master concealed in Tibet's landscape uh, texts that early Tibetans were not yet ready to read. The parallels between this tradition and the discovery of the Dunhuang manuscripts are so clear that one Tibetan living in Nepal, whom Sam von Skayak and I once paid to type into the computer de la Ville Poussin's uh, catalog of the Stein collection, um, this Tibetan even added his own electronic colophon, a brief prayer that any merit he might accrue through his typing might be dedicated to the uh, Dalai Lama and the Tibetan people. And in this prayer, he, he, dis he described the Dunhuang manuscripts as a big terma. So following this Tibetan fellow's lead, I want to introduce the two manuscripts I found while working in the British Library by telling a story. And this is a bit of a confessional. Uh, uh, the story represents my own attempt in part uh, to make sense of why I was such an idiot back in 2002 uh, when I first stumbled across the two manuscripts. Because as you'll see, I really was an incredible idiot. <laughs> Um, the, the, the story uh, that I'm going to tell is one of concealment, uh, discovery, reconcealment, rediscovery. Uh, and reconcealment is uh, also an important part of the Tibetan ter terima tradition. Each time, due to the karmic circumstances surrounding the discovery, the full revelation may not yet be possible. And sometimes it, so it has to wait for circumstances to change, and thus the treasure is reconcealed for a later time. Uh, and then it's rediscovered and worked on some more. So the Dunhuang uh, trove was first discovered in 1900 by the then self-appointed caretaker of the site, a Taoist monk pictured here named Wang Yuan Lu. Uh, Wang had had some sense of that his discovery was special, but the local officials whom he uh, notified were distracted, uh, preoccupied with the Boxer Rebellion and other more important concerns. They were uninterested in his report, so Wong packed the manuscripts back into the cave, and there they remained for another eight years till the next Territon came along. In 1908 and 1909, two European archaeologists arrived to re-excavate the hoard. Uh, both immediately grasped the significance of the find and quickly uh, purchased what they could from Wong. Uh, so Oral Stein's collection eventually made its way to the British Library, while Pelio's, Paul Pelio's Hall is today stored at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. Uh, both Stein and Pelio were scholars well-trained enough to recognize that this was an archaeological discovery on par with the greatest in history. But even then, neither had the time to make a full sense nor of nor even catalog the immense collection. That would have to wait for other circumstances to ripen. The Stein collection was examined again during World War I when uh, Louis de la Ville Poussin did his best to catalog the manuscripts. His work remained incomplete, presumably because the war came to an end and he was able to go home. His Zhangbu, his notes, were not published until 1962. Meanwhile, Marcel Laloux published a catalog of the Pelliot collection in France uh, in three parts between 1939 and 1961. Both of the resulting catalogs have long served scholars as gateways to the co two collections. Yet the significance of the Padmasambhava related manuscripts still remained unrecognized. Poussin uh, described IOL Tib J644 as uh, a treatise on the Pallas. Uh, and uh, while Lalu wrote of Pelio Tibetan 307, uh, Vajrayana rituals, and left it at that. Both Poussin and Lalu were great scholars, but in their day, tantric Buddhism was yet unappreciated and misunderstood. The karmic circumstances were still not right. Again, the two manuscripts had to wait. In 2002, the hapless Jacob Dalton arrived at the British Library as cataloger of the tantric manuscripts in the Stein collection. Uh, I'd only just finished my dissertation and had never read a Dunhuang manuscript in my life. <laughs> 
I still can't believe my luck. Soon after arriving at the library, it dawned on me that nobody had had such an opportunity in some ways since Poussin. Nobody had been free just to sit down and skim through the entire collection year after year. And in those first months, I stayed long after closing, squirreled away each night in a small room deep in the bowels of the library, whizzing through mi microfilms of the entire Stein and Pelio collections. At this early point, I was only looking for a few key words, terms that would immediately mark an item as significant. Padmasambhava was one of my main goals. And sure enough, I found his name in two manuscripts that were yet unstudied. I couldn't believe it. The circumstances had come together. I had discovered two new scholarly treasures. But my karma was still not ripe. A problem arose in the transcription of the discovery into a language that could be appreciated by others. In the Tibetan Terma tradition, the initial revelations may be written in the mysterious script of the Dakinis. At first, the treasure revealer may not be able to read those letters. In his lucid, dreamlike state, the words shimmer and resist clear, clear interpretation. Even after the initial discovery, then, the circumstances may not be quite right. The revealer still may need to cultivate a more stable mind. He must learn to approach his discovery in a more open and less fixated way. In those first months at the British Library, I was giddy with excitement. As the riches piled up, I grew ambitious, frankly. I became greedy. And I wanted to publish my discoveries as quickly as possible before anyone else could. I was young, and I was inexperienced. I was not accustomed to reading the messy and idiosyncratic scripts that fill the Dunhuang manuscripts. It was difficult for me to make sense of these two items I'd found. So I transcribed them onto my laptop. Impatiently, I started copying their obscure lines into a more user-friendly format, a Microsoft Word document. But then, as I came to the line in ITJ644, where the name Acharya Padmasambhava was written, the very line that had originally drawn my attention to the manuscript, my poor karma, my untrained state of mind, this is embarrassing to admit, overcame me, uh, and my eye skipped the fateful line. <laughs> and I continued my transcription merrily, uh, with no mention made of Tibet's second Buddha. My mind was simply not stable. My ego got in the way. Freud would say this could not have been a coincidence, that I was not ready to grow up that I was unconsciously sabotaging my own success. Maybe even I was still unwilling to kill my father. <laughs> I don't know what was going on with me. Uh, in any case, a couple years later, I published my article arguing that other elements in the manuscript could well have influenced the later legends surrounding Padmasambhava, but I could not point to the name. All I could do is point to the description of some unnamed tantric meditator who practiced in an Asura cave, beheld a vision of Vajrapani, and altered the landscape by sticking his foot into rock, thereby revealing a stream that descended from the Ashvakarna uh, spring on Mount Meru. All these elements are seen in later biographical accounts of Padmasambhava's activities, including Pelio Tibetan 44, the Waje, and Yangrel's 12th century Zonglingma that Lewis is going to talk about. In my article, I traced these narrative uh, continuities, but I could not be sure that my text's author had Padmasambhava specifically in mind. Indeed, Rob Mayer, in his uh, beneficence, went, on, went to vehement lengths to argue, argue absolutely that these tropes were com commonplace, and a better scholar than I would not have uh, even suggested such continuities. It was only years later, long after tenure, and far more experience with reading Dunhuang manuscripts that I returned to ITJ644, and now I read it for a completely different purpose, no longer fixated on Padmasambhava, and now I preferred reading the manuscript itself over my own transcription. And sure enough, finally, the line appeared to me. Truly a teaching on scholarly humility. Okay, I've got that off my chest. <laughs> uh, given the title of the exhibition that has occasioned this se seminar, the second Buddha, master of time, I should note one further element that is quite relevant here. The key passage in ITJ 644, pictured here, uh, the, 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 the key passage that I missed, appears within a wider discussion of the Vidyadhara uh, levels of accomplishment. The discussion ends by Padmasambhava, uh, calling Padmasambhava a second Buddha. 
quote, he should be understood as such in everything he does. There is no difference between a second Buddha and the first. They are equal. One only says second because of their different methods for gaining accomplishment, end quote. Already here then in a, in a late 10th century manuscript on the Vidyadar levels, Padmasambhava had become a legend. His practice was already serving as a model for later Tibetan tantrikas. While it is intriguing to see gathered in one place so many elements that would become key to his later biographical narratives, while we are seeing these, these elements in some sense in a raw form, they by no means represent an historical Padmasambhava who stands firmly outside of the Tibetan imagination. So here we may stop to ask ourselves, what would evidence for a real Padmasambhava even look like? Aside from his being mentioned in a, in a rock inscription, we are faced only with the Dunhuang manuscripts. One might be tempted to reply to Gray's doubts by arguing that the same uh, may hold true for any number of key figures from Tibet's imperial period history. Apart from the emperors and other political leaders, and with the notable exception of Bandai Nyang Ting uh, Zin, uh, who's mentioned in the inscriptions, we know of key Buddhist figures from Vairochana to Vimalamitra and so on, only from later Dunhuang uh, sources, from canonical colophons and later legendary accounts. Are we meant to doubt all of these too? But, Gray might reply, the bar really should be higher for Padmasambhava, a figure who is, after all, so prone to mythification. Less important figures might be less subject to the projections of the Tibetan imagination, but for Padmasambhava, the historian needs to tread most carefully. So what might reliable evidence look like? Perhaps if we were to find evidence of him as something less than a second Buddha. Perhaps some scrap that provided a glimpse of his all too human weaknesses. As we've already seen, IOL Tib J644 is certainly no such scrap. And the other manuscript I stumbled across uh, um, is likewise already imbricated, to use popular academic parlance, with myth. Here, the master is described traveling the Tibetan countryside doing battle with the seven goddesses of the local landscape. Turning to uh, Peleo Tibetan 44, we see him once again battling demons, though this time down in the Kathmandu Valley. It's interesting to note the role of Nepal here, for it purports to tell of Padmasambhava's pre-Tibetan existence. Were devout Tibetans of the 10th century already well on their way to developing an entire backstory for their second Buddha? Perhaps, but this might be a possible glimmer of his humanness. Certainly, the best piece of evidence we have from Dunhuang is the fourth manuscript I mentioned, IOL Tib J321, an extensive commentary to the Mahayoga Tantra, the Tapishakpa, or Lasso of Means. The commentary is, in fact, preserved in today's canon in the Tenjur, but is unattributed there. The Dunhuang version, seen here, is twice attributed to Padmasambhava, but both times in the copious interlinear notes. And here I should stop to mention that uh, Cantwell and Mayer have suggested that these lines, this attribution to Padmasambhava, that they might actually not be attributing the commentary to the master, uh, rather they might be saying that, that he wrote the, the root tantra that is being commented on itself. Frankly, I find this far-fetched. And indeed, an interlinear note at the beginning of the manuscript quite clearly states that the tantra was compiled by the Buddha and the commentary was composed by Padmasambhava. As a general rule, after all, when an interlinear note to a text makes an attribution, it's pretty safe to assume it has in mind the text in which it's written. The idea, moreover, that such notes might be explicitly stating that Padmasambhava wrote the Tantra would be utterly un unprecedented. So I follow what I take to be the obvious reading, that Padmasambhava is being said to have written the human authored commentary seen here. And indeed, it's precisely the humanness reflected in these interlinear notes that make them so intriguing. Here, Padmasambhava is treated not as a second Buddha who wrote tantras, but as a human author who wrote, quote unquote, without making it up himself, Rangzor Cheba Mayimbar. 
Even more intriguing, though, are the four lines of verse that serve as a kind of colophon to the commentary right down there. My translation, by a great marvel who has attained the supreme city, not of this world, the lotus king, Pema Gyalpo, by him the great secret pith instructions of the Tathagatas have been unraveled within the expanse. Homage to him." End quote. So these are lines of praise, and in that sense, you could be said to be uh, part of the myth-making that surrounds this master. But an interlinear note um, to the verse um, uh, adds some further dimension. Quote, the Acharya Shantigarbha having checked it, found it to be without error and praised Sambhava with the four lines. From the perspective of the later tradition, the idea that Padma Sambhava, the second Buddha, needed his composition to be checked for errors by someone named Shantigarbha is, is simply outlandish. Here then, I would argue, is our best little scrap of evidence that there may be an actual historical person beneath all this myth-making. Yes, it's just a scrap, or perhaps that's all real humans ever get. <laughs> so I want to end by adding to all this, I'm sorry I'm way over time, I'm sorry, but I'm just going to keep going. Uh, <laughs> um, I want to end by adding to this uh, some brief comments on this other source. No less than eight works attributed to Padmasambhava are found in today's Tibetan canon. Of these, four were translated after the 10th century, so we can kind of look at them askance. Um, the other four have no translators mentioned, so what to make of those? One of these four uh, happens also to be the longest text in the list. Here I'm talking about the third one there. Uh, more than double the length of the next longest work, Tohoku uh, 2679 represents a commentary on the Vajravidharana Dharani. The latter is a short Dharani Sutra that seems to date to around the late 7th century. Padmasambhava's treatise, if we were to accept the attribution that ends the text, was likely written around uh, the same time as, or perhaps shortly after, Buddha Gupta wrote his own commentary on the same dharani. Now, it's rare for a dharani to be the subject of a full-blown commentary. Uh, a student of James's who just did an MA on Buddha Gupta's commentary said, I think he's seen no other commentaries on Dharanis except for on the Vajravidharana. Uh, in any case, uh, and perhaps it's the sutra's focus on the wrathful Vajra Buddha family that had something to do with it. In any case, given that Dharanis are assigned to the very lowest classification of tantric writings, that of the Kriya class, it would be somewhat odd to attribute a commentary of all things on a mere Dharani of all things to Padmasambhava of all people. Unfortunately, I don't have much time to go into detail on this work, but in brief, its author is clearly someone immersed in the world of Mahayoga Tantra. In some ways, the author is careful to read the Dharani on its own terms. He explains, for example, that there are only three Buddha families and three ritual activities because it belongs to the Kriya class of Tantras. Um, he uh, also explains that the sutra is taught by Shakyamuni while seated upon the Vajrasana at, at Bodhgaya, a thoroughly untantric lo location that may be juxtaposed to Buddha Gupta's claim that it was taught atop Mount Meru. In other ways, however, our author's more Mahayoga leanings are evident. Thus, Shakyamuni sits there upon the Vajrasana at the center of a mandala, and our author goes to considerable lengths to describe the iconographies and ritual procedures required for constructing a Vajravidharana mandala, something quite foreign to a Dharani Sutra. Elsewhere, too, we see the influence of the more inward focus of the Mahayoga Tantras, uh, what Germano might call the, it's Gnost, their Gnostic approach. Uh, thus, the author repeatedly insists, for example, that specific states of contemplation must be maintained while reciting different parts of the spell. And in commenting on the sutra's standard opening, thus have I heard at one time, he suggests that the sutra was received with only a non-conceptual hearing consciousness. Still more interesting is the claim that Vajrapani, who teaches the sutra through Shakyamuni's blessings, is none other than Samantabhadra, the ultimate Buddha of the Guyagarbha and other late 8th century Mahayoga tantric systems. I could go on, but for now, let me end 
by returning to the question of whether this commentary really was written by Padmasambhava. While it would be odd to attribute such a work to a mas such a master, while all indications are that it was at least written by someone, probably an Indian, deeply immersed in the ritual minutia of uh, late 8th century tantric practice, there is one line that should give us pause. As seen so many times in other Tibetan writings, uh, this is often a clue that it's a fake, the author uh, provides a gloss on the Tibetan word for Buddha, Sangye, two syllables meant to mean awaken, Sang, and to expand, Ye. Thus we read, quote, because he awakens from the sleep of ignorance and because he expands the mind to, to what is to be understood, he is a Sangye, end quote. We must admit that such a gloss is unlikely to appear in a commentary originally composed in Sanskrit. And we may therefore have some doubt that this work really could have been written by Padmasambhava. That the co commentary's colophon names no translator begins to take on new significance. Perhaps then we have here a merely Tibetan authored work, one I still believe dates to the, uh, uh, dates to the early spread of uh, Buddhism into Tibet given the ritual themes expressed, a work that was only later falsely attributed to Padmasambhava. The other possibility, however, is that Padmasambhava wrote it for a Tibetan audience while in Tibet. This might sound a little desperate, but um, in fact, if we are to believe Shantigarbha's above cited, oh, here's the text, sorry. Uh, looks terrible, but anyway, I'll go back to this one. If we were to believe this, uh, this uh, verse of praise by Shantigarbha from this commentary on the Lasso of Means, it seems quite possible that Padmasambhava wrote that work while in Tibet and that hot off the press, it needed to then be checked by the esteemed Shantigarbha. And elsewhere too, I've suggested that the Mengaktawi Trengwa or Garland of Views that is commonly attributed to Padmasambhava might also have been written with a Tibetan audience in mind. In an article on tantric doxography, I've observed that the vast majority of early tan Indian tantric classification systems were driven by ritual concerns, while early Tibetans preferred to distinguish their tantric classes more by view. The garland of views falls clearly in the latter camp, reflecting Tibetan interests. Uh, and thus, if we were to uh, believe it really was written by Padmasambhava, as Rongzom in the 11th century claims, then we have here yet a third case, uh, a third text that he might have composed for a Tibetan audience during his time in Tibet. All, of course, all this evidence could be read in another way, as evidence that all sorts of compositions were falsely attributed to a figure who served as a lightning rod for the Tibetan imagination. In the end, we can never know for sure, but I personally still believe there really was someone named Sambhava who visited Tibet in the late 8th century and wrote on tantric matters for his Tibetan hosts. And this happened long before he became the fully mytholo mythologized Guru Rinpoche. Thanks. Um, so, as the uh, second discussant, um, I'm going to discuss uh, Padmasambhava and history. I'll start with um, the Padmasambhava bit, and then maybe at the end um, this can give us some clues about the uh, history part. Uh, so, this is a um, quite recognisable image of Padmasambhava that uh, many of you may be familiar with. Um, but I want to uh, maybe problematize uh, the image that we have of Padmasambhava by going back into the earlier period um, and looking at the early depiction. This is not so much the early depiction in art and iconography, which seems to only date from the uh, 13th century onwards, so there's no real help with getting very far back. But looking at the uh, literary depiction, and as uh, Jake has already uh, said our key source for this is uh, the Dunhuang documents that come from the Mogao Caves up here uh, near Dunhuang. And um, they describe a, um, a Padmasambhava of, I would say, uh, mythographic proportions, um, 
for the most part, for example, um, Paleo Tibetan 44, which uh, places Padmasambhava around here in the Himalayan foothills, going down from uh, Yangle Shu in uh, the kind of Nepal area down to Nalanda in India in search of uh, texts. Uh, this manuscript, actually the same, very same page that Jake showed, uh, contains here Padma Sambhava, uh, transliterated, uh, so one of the nice earliest kind of manuscript references to him. But here he is already a figure who has control over the natural landscape and is a great master, uh, standing at the very beginning of the tradition, important tantric tradition of Vajrakila, uh, the Purba there. Um, and he has the power to be able to overcome the um, indigenous forces of the Himalayan regions, um, to take uh, people who, uh, spirits who are threatening to kill him and put them into his magic hat and then take them out again, almost as a kind of amazing um, magic trick where they appear as a beautiful woman who is then entrusted by Padmasambhava as the uh, protector of the Vajrakilaya uh, text. So I would argue that um, such um, Dunhuang narratives already depict Padmasambhava from a, a superhuman um, perspective and do not really give us access to the kind of human Padmasambhava that we might be looking for, that perhaps um, Gray is wanting to postulate. Um, and even, I would say, though this is a bit off the fly, the, um, the example uh, that you gave from um, IOTJ321, uh, um, where um, Padmasambhava is praised, he's praised as the lotus um, king and as somebody who is not of this world. And then an interlinear note um, says that uh, this was checked by Shantigarbha. We would have to look, I think, in more detail about what it means to, um, to check a text, whether that casts any kind of um, negative light on the powers of Padmasambhava or not. Um, but I'll, I'll leave that up to a discussion, perhaps. Uh, still, uh, from my perspective, I would say that the Dunhuang material is not the place to go for a very human um, Padmasambhava. Further on into history, we get a slightly different um, depictions of Padmasambhava, but again, still in um, mythographic proportions. This is not to say mythographic um, as a myth uh, contrasted with fact, but um, a depiction of Padmasambhava that takes on epic proportions, like in the Dunhuang text in Paleo-Tibetan 44 that I just mentioned, he is very much the first uh, tantric master at the beginning of a great, um, important tantric lineage. Here, in a slightly later history from the um, late 11th century or possibly early 1100s, uh, the Bashe, which was translated in uh, Pasang Wangdu and Hildegard Dienberger's book of uh, 2000, which I very much recommend as a, a window onto an early uh, historiographic source of the empire. Um, this nam this um, description focuses on Trisong Detsen, on the emperor, uh, the 8th century emperor, and his attempt to build Samye Monastery. Um, he is aided in this by um, his minister, Ba Selnang, uh, but also by Indian figures, uh, Shantarakshita, uh, and also in the version that we have, uh, Padmasambhava. Now, Padmasambhava plays a limited role here. Um, he comes into the text. Uh, he's invited by Shantarakshita. Um, there's evidence to suggest that even this um, description of him may be interpolated into an earlier account of the empire which didn't have Padmasambhava playing a role. Um, but in this manuscript that we have, uh, which dates from much later than the 1100s, um, he has um, a role to play as the arch tamer of Tibetan um, indigenous forces. He comes in, um, he is at the beck and call of the emperor, uh, but he um, shows up the emperor, especially when the emperor uh, starts to mistrust him and asks him to leave Tibet halfway through the narrative. Um, 
he says to the emperor as he is leaving, um, I was wanting to pacify the whole of Tibet for the good of the Dharma in the future, but because of the mistrust of the king, uh, the Dharma will uh, decline. So even in this text, relatively early historiographical text, he um, shows up the king and um, is in at least a kind of morally or religiously superior um, status to him. But there is a sense of continuity with the Dunhuang documents, for example, with Peleo Tibetan 44, where he is a tamer of um, indigenous deities. Then, to go on into the 12th century, we have a slightly different Nyangro. Here is a Nyangro, I mean, a slightly different Padmasambhava um, from the uh, hand of Nyangro Nima Oza, who is a 12th century master. Um, it has been hypothesized that this is an early depiction of him um, acting as a devotee under the feet of Padmasambhava with his two consorts. So in this, which seems to be the full, full, first full-length biography of Padmasambhava, um, Padmasambhava is given a birth narrative. Uh, he is born on a lotus in Udiana, um, and then orchestrates his own exile uh, in order to go around tantric sites in India before coming home and uh, showing up his father uh, in um, what could be, um, in some ways, a Freudian narrative and uh, taming the area of um, Udiana for the Dharma. Then, when he goes to Tibet, he plays a similar role in Tibet. He shows up the emperor Trisong Detsen, um, who then becomes his tantric disciple. And from that point onwards, Padmasambhava is always his uh, religious superior. As a contrast, a perhaps contemporaneous history uh, describes Padmasambhava in similar terms, but almost as a mirror image. This is the 12th century uh, Drakpa Lingdrak Bumpo history of the decline of um, the Bon indigenous religion in Tibet at the hands of Buddhists. So here, uh, Padmasambhava is described as an antinomian monk. He wears the monk's robes, uh, but he uh, drinks blood and he does other antinomian practices, which in this narrative are cast in a very negative uh, light. He's also predestined in this story to obstruct Bon and so weaken Tibet on the battlefield and as an imperial power. So once he comes to Tibet, he's supported by Trisong Detsen. Um, he becomes Trisong Detsen's master, quite similar to in the Zhang Lingma, um, in the Buddhist. But um, he is then opposed by the hero of the narrative, Drempa Namka, who is a Bonpo um, figure, and who betters Padmasambhava. Uh, so in this narrative, Padmasambhava's um, historicity is not called into question, but his power is certainly uh, questioned. And it is said that the people of Tibet and the forces of Tibet also oppose uh, Padmasambhava. And the spirits, the indigenous spirits, uh, rise up and er eventually cause Padmasambhava to be exiled from Tibet. But this is too late. Buddhism has already um, got its claws into the uh, the land, and so Bon will decline. Thanks. So, um, over time, this narrative becomes uh, expanded, and I won't go into the many different um, ways that this uh, happens, but we can see a, a process of maturation with possibly a line of continuity coming from the earliest texts um, through to the later uh, biographies of Padmasambhava. I would argue um, that the Dunhuang sources are already mythographic. Again, that doesn't mean um, they are uh, false, but it means that they describe a very different Padmasambhava that maybe we would be imagining if we want to talk about the historicity of Padmasambhava. Then, perhaps narratives interpolated into wider histories show the rise of the cult of Padmasambhava, 
And again, I don't mean cult in a pejorative term, I just mean a small following, perhaps in the southern Tibetan regions, um, connected with the kind of areas that he said to have inhabited in Paleo-Tibetan 44 in the Dunhuang texts, grows over, um, spreads into the heartland of Tibet. And then historians writing on the period feel the need to incorporate this master, though they may not have any personal devotion to him, within the narrative of the spread of Buddhism uh, in the country. Then in the 12th century, Nyangran Nima Oza, who was certainly a devotee of uh, Padmasambhava, writes, draws on the floating traditions existing around his area in southern Tibet, um, and also possibly written sources. There are um, there's evidence that some of the narratives in his work on Padmasambhava are very similar to the um, Dunhuang narratives that we find. So again, some sense of continuity. But he it, it expands the story, gives Padmasambhava a very otherworldly type of birth and um, writes him almost as uh, a second Buddha. And then we saw the contrast the Bumpo mirror image, which again um, doesn't question the existence of Padmasambhava, but uh, questions his traits, really flips them on their head um, and rewrites a narrative for the Bumpo perspective in which Padmasambhava comes to Tibet and has a relationship with um, the emperor, but fails um, in some ways um, in his role as the arch tamer of Tibet. So, what does that say about um, Padmasambhava and history? Well, I would like to say that I don't think the um, early tradition would have um, described the historicity of Padmasambhava in the terms that maybe we would, or uh, Gray would be talking about it uh, today. Um, for them, this Padmasambhava, uh, from our earliest textual traditions, was already a, uh, a, a superhuman figure. So I think when we look at these traditions, it's perhaps more important to chart the growing um, status of Padmasambhava in the culture. Look at the historiographical element of Padmasambhava rather than his historicity. Um, maybe look at the textual tradition and then the art historical tradition and the cultural tradition almost as a person itself that is born at some point in the midst of time, matures, um, is seen from different perspectives, has different meaning for different people with whom it relates, um, and perhaps the discussion of the historicity of a, a slightly more human Padmasambhava can fall into the background um, as these kind of questions are followed in the future. So, thank you for your time. Thanks so much to these uh, three presenters. We'll have a few minutes for them to continue their discussion uh, together, and then we'll open it up to questions and comments from the audience. Um, so if I can respond, this is, this is exactly what I've kind of always wanted to, to have uh, for this period. And, and I think if, if the kind of work, I mean, I think you're both doing different work. You're looking for the human a little bit, uh, although acknowledging that there's a, uh, a mythical you know, reference and, and the, you're looking at the, at, at the creation of the myth. I think if your work were brought into um, narratives of the Tibetan Empire and and all the, you know the stretch of Tibetan history. I think that would would make me not even need to ask the questions I ask. If we could say, you know, Samya was founded, Trisom Ditsen founded it, and then maybe as a kind of footnote toward the end of the fall of the empire, and later, you know, this figure Padmasambhava shows up in the Dunhuang manuscripts, but only in the Himalayan, you know, frontiers but having this important role of taming the landscape and so forth. Um, if, if it could get separated out from, you know, if we're not putting that Nyangral narrative back into the imperial period, I would feel comfortable. And that's, in fact, uh, the whole reason that I got engaged in thinking about this and when Elena asked me if I would 
participate in this conference, I said, well, the only connection that I have to Padmasubhava is trying to figure out, you know, how to write and tell the history of Tibet. Um, Curtis and I are under contract. I think we've been under contract for 15 years now to, to, write, to write a uh, cultural, and history, cultural and historical narrative of Tibet. Um, and, and that's the kind of presentation you gave today is exactly how I've tried to think of how to work in Padma Sambhava because he, he could become a recurring figure that by the time you get to the, you know, the period that I'm interested in, um, in the 17th century, you know, not only is Padma Sambhava becoming, you know, ha has he become really important, but he becomes the vehicle through which uh, a woman's, an imperial woman's biography can become a source of history in its own right. So I would kind of revisit Padma Sambhava iteratively in history. But I think the, the main caution I would give us as Western historians is not to, to take Nyangrel's fully developed narrative, which I think is really about what's going on in the contemporary context, right? Padmasambhava as challenging the, the emperors is all about the power of the, the contemporary Buddhist figures in 12th century Tibet to challenge the remnants of the, the, the imperial families that are kind of ensconced in Lhasa and fighting with each other and, and so forth. And if we historicize these, the recurrence of Padmasambhava over time, um, you know, up to the present, right? What's the role of Jigme Punsuk in reviving Tibetan Buddhism in the face of a kind of anti-Galupa PRC government who's more willing to have a Nyingma uh, figure and, and let those Nyingma abbots come out to the West. And I've been on the stage here with Sonam Darge and we, we, you know, frequently host. If it becomes an iterative process to think about the development of the role of Padmasambhava over time, then I think I would, I would be much more settled in my sort of accepting the development of this figure over time. Yeah, I would just add that I, I've recently taught Nyangrel to some undergraduates and you know read it for the umpteenth time, but this time I was really just so strongly struck by the fact that this is a 12th century text. And I, and I, I was seeing it really in terms of a, a Nyingma defense of Nyingma tantras, and there's constantly it's listing all the tantras. And if you look at the, the narrative sort of theme that just keeps recurring over and over again. It's, you know, Padmasambhava and various figures represent the Nyingma school and tantric interests, and they're questioned over and over again, and then disaster befalls Tibet over and over again. So it's really just kind of very much a kind of, you know. Polemic about the times. Exactly. Yeah. You know. And the ministers of the fall guys, you know, <laughs> represent the, maybe the Sarma critics. Yeah, I, I think this, um, the kind of literary view yeah, has a lot of kind of um, uh, legs to it. But the return to this kind of idea of uh, historicity, it's interesting that um, you kind of shifted the, um, the perspective from uh, the literary view to perhaps the kind of doctrinal view. And that seems to offer up some kind of, um, some way of getting further back into time, which is um, interesting parallel. We mentioned before, um, Socrates, and Socrates is another problem, problem in history where people don't know exactly who, whether there was a historical Socrates. Um, and it seems that people have come down to two main ways of, of arguing uh, what the kind of historical Socrates might have been. And one is from um, a narrative text position, so looking at um, his representation in Plato as a person or his lambasting in uh, Xenoph Xenophanes. Um, or there is the doctrinal perspective, which is to look at whether you can make an internally um, coherent position uh, from those different pieces of evidence, not just with uh, using Plato, but also using his detractors. Um, and that might, might be a way uh, forward with uh, Padmas and Balva. Um, yeah. So um, I think, yeah, very interesting. I would just urge, if you all are doing this, to do it in a, at least make one version of it that uh, is accessible to a wider audience. Sure. So, you know, the, the Wikipedia <laughs> site on Padmas and Bhava, I looked at it this morning, and I, it needs some updating, mm. given what you've told us today. So it would be wonderful mm. if you could, you know, make that accessible as you, as you narrate those you know, engagements with this material.